So can you tell me a little bit about yourself, like your name, where you live and work? Okay. Michael Kavanagh is my name. I work at Sydney University. I also work in private practice. And um, I live in Sydney. Yeah. And, and what do you do? I uh, teach. I'm the Deputy Director of the uh, Coaching Psychology Unit. So I teach coaching, um, predominantly organisational coaching and executive coaching, uh, to postgraduate students. Also, a practicing coach and facilitate leadership and coaching workshops. And so, what, what's your training background? So, my training and background is um, I've got um, a Bachelor of Arts honours, a Master of Clinical Psychology, and a PhD. Um, and I've also been working for the last 12 years at the Coaching Psychology Unit, developing the degree here. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and positive psychology, how did you get to know about that? So positive psychology is something that um, ever since the beginning of my um, uh, clinical training has been something that I've been learning about. Um, it's, it, it's interesting to me because I'm not exactly sure what fits into positive psychology. Um, and, uh, but my understanding of it is uh, a sort of psychology that focuses on um, performance, if you like, and what, what creates good performance rather than the remediation of yeah. poor performance or, or uh, negative emotional states. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the people that you normally coach, who, who are they? So I coach people from organisations uh, predominantly. I also um, supervise coaches here at the university and elsewhere. Um, so they're normally people drawn from almost every level in organisations, from chairs of corporates down to supervisors. And, and what challenges do they want to work on? Uh, gosh, the, the, all sorts of challenges. I mean, everything from improving their leadership style to developing their views of the world through to, um, in some cases, just plain straightforward skills development. So all sorts of different challenges. Mostly those challenges revolve around um, how they can perform more effectively or how they can improve their relationships with others. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and uh, what does a coaching engagement look like? like? What happens before you meet people, when you meet people, in between? That varies depending on, on the type of engagement. Sometimes um, someone will call me and ask to be coached. Um, and so what will happen before coaching begins is, is a sort of a brief assessment of what it is that they're hoping to gain from coaching. Sometimes I'll be contacted by organisations, uh, typically a manager or someone in the HR learning and development function, and they'll be wanting to refer someone to me for coaching. And so there'll be a brief discussion about what are the issues that um, have driven this referral. And then typically I'll have a meeting with either with the manager and the person being coached or simply with the person being coached to talk about what they want to get out of the coaching. And, and what, that, what happens then after that? Then the coaching sessions begin, if you like. Um, we, we will have contracted you know, how, how long the coaching will go for and you know, what sort of goals the coaching will be working on. Um, I'll have talked about how I will work with people um, and then we'll have several sessions of coaching, however many has been contracted. Um, and then at some point we'll do an assessment at, in the middle about how the coaching's unfolding and whether it's working well for the person. Are we getting to where we want it to go? And we may do more coaching after that and then um, some sort of evaluation at the end. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So this, is it that the same assessment in the beginning, middle, end? or? Uh, it depends on the, on the situation. So sometimes those assessments will be more formal. Sometimes they'll be just a discussion between myself and the coach. Um, sometimes they will involve a three-way discussion between the coach the person doing the, uh, the, the coach's manager and myself. So it, it varies. Right, right. Sometimes instruments are used, sometimes they're not. Right, right. And, and what typically happens in the first session? Um, in the first session, it's typically about trying to understand what the story is that the coach is 
bring to the coaching. So um, the, the process that I would describe it as is case conceptualization. Um, we have a conversation, a dialogue, a discussion about what's going on for the coachee and how do we understand that. And so the first couple of sessions, or the early part of the coaching engagement, is largely trying to wrap our heads around what is it that we're working on and what, what are the dynamics of the situation that are going on uh, before we start to jump into solutions or anything like that. Right, and what, what happens after you find it, when you kind of feel that you have an understanding? Um, well, that understanding is is never set in concrete, so it's always something that develops across the course of the coaching engagement. But typically, we will work with that understanding to ask, well, what then needs to happen differently? So the sort of approach that I have to coaching um, is something I've published in, in a model called the Three Reflective Spaces model, which suggests that coaching is a complex adaptive system that um, that develops or emerges between the coach and the coachee. And that there are elements of what goes on in that system that the coach contributes to and that the coachee contributes to. But what emerges from that system is neither determined by the coach nor the coachee. It's something that emerges as a result of the interaction between them, yeah. if you like. Yeah. So, Thinking, you know, I find the questions about what do I do first, what do I do second, what do I do third, somewhat difficult to answer, because that actually changes as the coaching relationship e emerges. Um, and so, for some people, there'll be assessments up front. For some people, assessment will come a bit later. For some people, there may be no formal assessments, if you like. Right. Yeah. But the process of assessing what's going on carries right throughout the whole right, right. coaching engagement. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there other things that carries yeah. through? Um, well, the process of dialogue, I guess, is something that, that carries through. It's the process of really trying to understand how is this person seeing the world and seeing what's going on? And what does that enable and what does that constrain? And so the process of dialogue involves their mental models and my mental models meeting, yeah. if you like, and, and rubbing up against each other. And that will create um, questions or tensions that then hopefully will, um, will not be resolved so much as, as create the possibility of bigger, more effective mental models. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, so what I mean by mental models is schemas or understandings of what's going on and and, and how the world works and how people work or, or what's relevant to this issue. Yeah, yeah. And so that's an ongoing process. Right. Yeah. Are there ongoing processes in the engagement? In the engagement? Yeah, in the, in the whole... Say some more about the question. So, so, it's, it's, so if it's not stepwise that you're doing something, like first you do this, then you do that, mm. but you're doing more based on principles, or mm -hmm. so, so other principles, other things that go on? Well, one is that... Um, any of the mental models that we create together need to be checked and so oftentimes that will involve doing homework or um, I'm, I'm struggling with the way I'm answering this actually yeah, because yeah. it's a very abstract way of saying mental models it's like our understandings of what's going on sometimes need to be checked yeah and so there may be homework associated with going out and checking out assumptions and understandings um, typically any action plans or any potential action plans need to be implemented in some way or um, maybe there's experiments that people do yeah. to test what action plan might be most effective. So following each session there's typically some stuff that the person needs to go away and do in order to move closer towards their goal and that might involve thinking about things, it might involve particular actions that are implemented in the real world and might involve gathering data. Right, right. So, and so what could be an example, just one specific example? Okay, so um, um, for instance, a person might have an assumption that they're, um, that they're not able to come up with 
new ideas or new ways of doing things. They might go and check that out. Or um, another example might be um, that, um, sorry, it's hard to think about this in a sort of a concrete way. Um, So let's edit some, some yeah, of this out yeah, while yeah. I think. Um, what would be another example? Another example might be... Um, okay, so I was, I was once coaching an um, executive who um, was finding that they were getting... Um, they were getting um, discombobulated or, or getting confused by the demands being placed upon them. Yeah. And their experience of that was that they were feeling overwhelmed by the demands and therefore not being able to focus their attention and, um, on what they needed to focus their attention on and were ending up in a sort of a confused running around type state. Yeah. So um, when we explored what that looked like and talked about it, then the it became clear that one of the, the interventions, for instance, that might be useful would be to practice some mindfulness. So to you know, develop a regular um, pattern of meditation. And so part of the, the homework then was to go away and meditate and come back with, um, with that experience, if you like. Yeah. Um, and to talk about how that impacted on their sense of self and their sense of calmness and their capacity to deal with um, multiple conflicting demands. Right, right. So, so in between sessions, do you usually give homework or just sometimes? Usually. Usually? Um, in fact, almost all the time. Okay. And, and how do you follow up on it? Um, at the next session. Typically, you'll ask, what happened? This is what you said you were going to go away and do. What, what happened? Or this was the, um, the, the area that we we're talking about. What did you come up with there? And if the person has done it or not done it? then you deal with whatever happens. So if, they, um, if they've done it, then you talk about what they've done, and maybe that leads into that coaching session. If they haven't done it, then you might talk about that. Understand why they haven't done it. You know, it might be that something else is more pressing at the moment, or they haven't had time, or maybe they went away and felt like it wasn't really adding any value. Right. And so you just deal with what emerges. Right, right. Result and sort of pick it up from there. Right, right. Yeah. And and you mentioned assessments before. Uh, some were formal, some weren't. Consistent. Yeah, so so um, depending on the situation of the client, um, different measures might be useful. So, if, for instance, um, if I'm concerned that depression or anxiety might be, or there might be some sort of mental health issue going on, then I might do a, a screening for mental health issues such as you know, using the DAS, the depression, anxiety, and stress scale. Um, at certain points, it might be useful to assess people's thinking styles in terms of the, you know, something like, say, Seligman's optimism questionnaire, or the values in action stuff. So looking at, you know, what are, what are the values that drive a person? Um, we might be dealing with perceived locus of causality, so um, how people actually relate to their goals and in a case like that something like the G-cost might be useful. Um, occasionally uh, one of the one of the metrics that organisations want to deal with are things like 360 instruments. It's not occasionally, it's quite, quite often and so they may be involved in the coaching so we might be you know using data from their 360 reports or from their performance reviews and so on. So there's lots of different measures that get used at different times with different people. Yeah, yeah. And, and how do you know which one to use and when? This is, comes back to that idea of case conceptualization. What's, what's going on for the client? So there are no measures that I routinely throw at clients, that I routinely request of clients. Um, the only measures that are used, that I use, are used because they relate specifically to whatever the coaching is about and the dynamics of that. So understanding what the, what's going on for the client um, together 
then make sense of the use of metrics. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, so my coaching is driven by that, not by the metrics. Right, right, right. Yeah. There was recently in, in Denmark a discussion about screening for mm -hmm. mental health issues, and, and one suggestion was to do it like routinely. Mm -hmm. but, but you mentioned you sometimes use the DAS. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, and so um, if I have concerns that one of these issues might be operating, then I'll, I'll choose a measure and, and use that. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, I don't think, uh, I think it's a reasonably good idea to do routine mental health screening, particularly if you don't have diagnostic skills yourself. Um, so I'm not against the use of routine mental health screens. They have to be introduced properly into the, um, into the coaching relationship, if you like, but uh, if that's done well, I don't have a problem with it. Right, right, right. I just don't tend to use those things myself because I can do the, the diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and when you use an assessment, uh, what happens? Does the person take the assessment in the session or between sessions? Um, it depends. Sometimes it's in the session, sometimes it's between sessions. Most often it's between sessions. And, and what, what happens then when they come back? Well, then I, I get the results back, typically they'll email them back to me and I'll have a look at them and we'll discuss it in the next session. So if there is a mental health issue going on, for instance, um, and sometimes you don't need a screen to know that, um, then the next session may be about referral for that issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and the discussion, what could that look like? What could be an example of a discussion? Of a okay. referral discussion? No, no, a uh, discussion of uh, an assessment like the VIA or one of the other assessments. Okay, so it's like this This is what depends on actually what the, the measure says. So the VIA, for instance, you know, you talk about, well, these are the, the values that have been identified as being core values for you and, and particularly important values for you. What do you think? Right. Um, you know, how do you feel when you look at that sort of stuff? And then the, those responses, do you think that captures you or? captures the way that you relate to the world, does it give you a sense of energy, all those sorts of questions. Yeah. Um, and then it would be about, and what does this mean for your goal? Right. So it's always related back to the goal of, of the coaching. Right, right. Um, with the mental health screens, it, um, or personality screens, or 360 instruments, it's also about, you know, what do you understand by this? You know, here are the results, how does that, how do you relate to those? Right. Um, sometimes there's um, a requirement to actually explain the results in terms of what they mean, so that, of course, they're not always immediately obvious. So you might do that as well, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's one more thing. And, and you said also in informal assessments, what could be an example of that? So um, informal assessments, I mean anything other than pen and paper tests. So it might be sitting down with that person or with uh, that person's manager or with, most typically with that person's manager and that person asking what's going on. Yeah. You know, what, what are the issues for which this person is being referred for coaching? How do they understand those issues? Um, when I'm there with the person. So typically what I'll do is, if I do have a three-way meeting, I'll also meet alone with the coachee to see if what happened in the three-way meeting is actually what they perceive to be the case. Because there are power imbalances between managers and their employees. Yeah. And so I think it's very important that um, the employees in a safe environment get to um, talk about what's really going on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, uh, Sorry. <laughs> um, you you mentioned goals, uh, the the goal of the the coaching. Yep. When, when do you set the goal, and how do you do that? The goal of the coaching changes across time, typically. So um, it may often get it, it varies from coaching engagement to coaching engagement, and from organisation to organisation. Some organisations are happy. For, for me and the coachee to set whatever goals we think are useful. Others have very specific outcomes they're looking for from coaching. 
So it might be an increase in ratings of this person's leadership in some facet. So those sorts of goals, those sorts of performance goals, if you like, are one aspect of the goal setting. You then have to sort of dig underneath them and say, well, what's going on in that area of their performance? And therefore, what sub-goals are required and if, if you're going to change yeah. um, that, that primary goal, if you like. You might also find across the course of the coaching that that goal that's been identified is probably not, or it may not be the best way of actually articulating what needs to change. And so you need to renegotiate the goal over time. So when is it set? Um, we set it early and we continue to reset it right throughout. Right, right. So I think the process of goal setting is like, circling around the area in order to understand what's going on and you eventually get closer and closer and closer to the things that um, really need to change. Right, right, right. And, and uh, just a curious question because I, I'm personally professionally interested in measuring you know, progress towards the goal, but how can I do that if it changes? Mm. Do, do That's you, a good question. Do you have any ideas? Um, I would challenge the whole, in a sense, the whole notion of, so why are you measuring progress towards the goal? And that's the real question that I would have. Um, so for whose benefit is that measurement of progress against the goal? Yeah. Yeah. Is it so that the coach feels like they're doing a good job? Or is it so the organisation feels like they're getting value for money? Or is it so that the coachee feels like they're making progress? Yeah. And um, if... If it's the last part? If it's the last part, then um, the real question is progress towards what? What are they hoping that the coaching will achieve for them? So one of the, one of the, the things that you need to differentiate is what sort of coaching are you doing? What's, what's, the, what's the main focus of the coaching? Is it skills development? If it is, then assessing progress towards the goal can be done relatively easy, easily in terms of identifying what is the skill that's needed to be performed, what are the different levels of that skill, can this person perform those yeah. skills at that level, you know, what's their competency. If it's performance coaching, that's typically measured against some sort of a metric, you know, number of sales or whatever it is. You can measure progress towards the goal. In developmental coaching, that's a much harder thing to, to, to measure. So developmental coaching is about really looking at the way the person makes meaning in the world. And there's not really clear metrics around that. Mm -hmm. And so the, the notion of measuring progress towards the goal is a little bit, um, is a lot harder, yeah. if you like. So you tend to use proxy measures like that for, you know, sort of, how much of the world does the person feel that, or how much change does the person feel that they've made in being able to see the world in its, in, or whatever aspect of the world they're talking about, um, in a greater deal of, with, with a greater degree of complexity. Right, right. How many options are now open to the person that weren't open to the person before, and so on. So there are ways of measuring progress to the, toward the goal, yeah. but, um, the notion of, you know, sort of breaking it down into sort of rigid, sort of stepwise fashion doesn't really work very well for the sort of coaching that I tend to do. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. What about uh, interventions? You, you mentioned some. So, so which which interventions do you use? Um, I use lots of different types of interventions. So what, what could be examples? Well, it depends on what's going on for the client, so they need to be... Um, address the issues and the dynamics that we identify together. Yeah. So what are some of the things we might use cognitive behavioural um, approaches, so you know, cognitive restructuring, that sort of stuff. We might use um, approaches based on mindfulness, uh, complex adaptive systems type approaches, um, solution focused approaches, um, and, and combinations of these things too. So most of the cognitive behavioural stuff that I do will also be solution focused. Right, right. So solution focused, cognitive behavioural. Um, you know, 
um, interventions develop from theories such as broaden and build, um, uh, goal setting um, things. Um, so you know, uh, self determination theory might drive some of the approaches. And so on. So there's so, lots of different approaches. So, so what could be an example from broaden and build or solution focused or mindfulness? Um, so an example from solution focus would be helping the person to identify in requisite detail what's the um, what what outcome they're looking for. Yeah. yeah. Mindfulness might be about helping to develop a mindfulness practice, um, and develop control over one's attentional resources. Uh, broaden and build will be um, developing the capacity to create positive emotional spaces in themselves and in the teams that they're in. Right, right, right. And there'll be a number of techniques that you can use for that. So, for instance, encouraging dialogue, um, looking at the, the degree of positivity versus negativity in the way that uh, meetings and, and self talk and so on is structured. And self-determination theory? Self-determination theory, so that would be looking at things like um, perceived locus of causality, the type of goals that people are setting and their relationship to those goals. And when you say relationship to the goals, can, can you explain that? So, I, so, for instance, some of the research findings suggest that people with higher um, degrees of um, Higher proportion of goals that they find that they experience as being extrinsic um, have lower levels of satisfaction, even when those goals are met. Yeah. Vice versa with um, intrinsic goals. Yeah. yeah. So um, one of the interventions there might be looking at um, what are the goals that people are holding and how are they holding them? Are they holding them as in an intrinsic way, so that you know, this is something that feels like if I get this done, it really builds my sense of self, it's something I, I love doing or, or really want to do versus something I feel I should do or have to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then looking at how do you, if, if the person has a high proportion of should do and have to type goals, how do you help them connect those to values that are a more intrinsic form? Yeah. And, and how, how could you do that? Um, by helping under, so that's where something like the, the VIA, the Values in Action um, assessment might be really useful to look at how does this, the doing of this relate to some of those important values in the person's life, such as you know, honesty or um, um, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What about all your knowledge of this research, do you share that when you coach people? Yes. And how, how do you do that? Um, it varies from time to time. Sometimes as part of the, the case conceptualization process, if you like, and part of the intervention planning process, sometimes it's useful to talk about what the research says yeah. um, or to draw up models on the, on the whiteboard sitting behind you that you know, I'll often draw up models with the person and ask them, you know, do, do they think that this might be a useful thing to start thinking about? Yeah. Um, so there'll be a bit of sort of psychoeducation associated with the coaching from time to time. Um, sometimes, though, those that research is just implicit in the sorts of questions that get asked and and the sorts of um, interventions that are created. Typically, though, the default position is to um, give the person or a, to work from where the person's at. So they they get to design the, the interventions as much as possible but once again it's not a they're the boss I just follow it's 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 a complex adaptive system so that their knowledge and my knowledge are important in to be discussed in terms of creating good quality goals and action plans and and when you say that they contribute in creating the interventions mm -hmm. so so how how would you develop a whole new intervention or would you take an existing one and, and change it or what, what, what would you um, Typically interventions are done, you know, are adapted to the person. So um, 
for instance, mindfulness. The person, in order for the person to sort of think of mindfulness as a useful intervention for them, they have to understand why it might be useful. Yeah. So, part of that process is about understanding what's the dynamics of the way that they're relating to their thoughts, for instance. Whether they're being captured by um, repetitive thinking or, or negative um, consequences of their thinking or you know, fears about what might happen and so on. Noticing that process with them yeah. and making it object, stepping back from it and saying, so it sounds like, you know, as you're thinking about this, you get into a cycle of rumination and that's associated with a with um, you know, sort of worrying about what might be the impacts and so on. Would it be useful if you could notice what was going on and not be so caught up emotionally in it? And if the person says, yeah, that'd be great, then well, one way you can do that is through something called mindfulness meditation. And then you talk about what that looks like and then you might adapt those practices to the, to the particular person. And when you say adapted to a particular person, what, what, what do you mean? Well, so, okay, so this is how it's normally done. How would it work for you if you were doing it? So, um, when would you do it? How could you do it? So, for instance, for that person, it might work better for them to go to a, a mindfulness training course and to join a group who, who practice mindfulness. Yeah. Because that puts a structure into their world. Yeah. For another person, it might work really well to read a book on mindfulness meditation and start to implement that themselves. Yeah. For another person, it might work to use a tape that guides them through a meditative practice and so on. Um, so, you know, when they do it, how they do it, what sort of structures they put around it will all be, in a sense, up for grabs. Right, right, right. right, right. And, and, uh so, so do, you, do you adapt other things to the clients? Like this is the intervention, the action plan, and do you adapt uh, some of the assessments, some of uh, the theories, the models, or the yeah, language? Adapt, or? adapt seems, seems to give the impression that what we do is we have this sort of off-the-shelf stuff and, and now we'll just change it to suit you. Whereas a lot of those interventions are actually developed with the client. So when, so for instance, if we have a uh, an understanding that um, that a particular pattern of thinking is getting in their way or that a particular pattern of thinking might be more useful the question will be what can we do to um, to embed that sort of pattern of thinking and so they'll come up with ideas and I'll come up with ideas and together we'll create the intervention so the sense of in that sense, it's adapted to them. It, it is, it, it's tailored to their particular issues and their particular needs. Right, right, right. Sometimes we'll pull off the shelf sort of interventions, like, um, well, mindfulness is a good example, and adapt that to their particular needs. Others, other things might be, so for instance, exposure and response prevention, which is a type of. Um, intervention that comes out of therapy in situations where people are anxious, for instance. It's an experimental um, uh, sort of a way that they can experiment with being in the anxiety provoking situation and experience it differently. Yeah. And so there are certain rules, if you like, about how that thing, how, how exposure and response prevention is done well. Part of the, the rules of that is that you, you you do it in a stepped fashion that needs to be adapted to the person. Yeah. So we'll do that. And and when when do you take something down from the show and, and when do you develop it? It depends on what on what the issue if there is something on the shelf that's been tried and tested and has a good evidence base. Um, if there's something there that actually meets the need, then you use it. Um, and the degree to which it is acceptable and useful to the client, it doesn't need to be adapted. Right. But not everything is easily you know, taken on by clients or works as well for clients. And so 
as they're using it or as they're thinking about it, you adapt it to make it more useful to them. Right, right, right. And, and but in order to do that adaptation, you really have to know the principles that are being applied, you know, so, um, so that you don't actually destroy the thing that makes it useful. Can you say something so, more? Right? Okay, I'll use an example. So, um, cognitive restructuring, for instance, um, noticing one's automatic thoughts and replacing them with, with more performance enhancing thoughts. Now, there are principles associated with that. So, so for a performance enhancing thought to be effective, it has to be realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Now, just taking um, a thought like "I'm no good" and replacing it with its opposite "I'm great" may not be useful. Mm -hmm. right? So, what you might need to to ask the person is, so what what would be a more effective thought there? And if they say, "Well, I'm good. I can do this." Okay, as you're thinking about that, do you really believe that you can do this? Well, no, I really feel like I'm sort of kidding myself. Okay, so what do you believe might be more useful? And it might be, if I work hard at this, I'll get better. Yeah. So that will be a more performance enhancing thought for the person, rather than just taking the opposite of the, the negative thought. So um, if you don't know that principle, then you might just accept the first thing the person say, says and say, great, we'll just go with that. And then you're not getting any, you may not get um, any um, effective response. Yeah. So, so, so knowing the principles before you start changing the off-the-shelf interventions? Yeah, I think that's very important. Yeah. yeah. And, and what about, I, there are some other factors that might influence outcome, like um, the expectations that the, the, the you have for, for, for progress and the expectations that the, the, the client has. Yep. Do you do something to create positive expectations or realistic expectations? For progress? Yeah, yeah we, that's, that's sort of embedded in almost every uh, session in that we're talking about the goals and what needs to happen. Um, I also regularly ask um, the question about how confident are they they can achieve this action step or that goal. Um, and if they're not very confident, then we talk about it. So that, you know, the last thing I think that's useful is setting up an expectation that people will be able to change in ways that they can't. So that, you know, change will be radical and quick. Um, if that's not on the horizon for them. Um, at the same time, you've got to be careful about limiting what's possible in people's minds. Um, and so that becomes a dialogue between you and the client. Right, right, right. And, and what about your relationship with your clients? H how do you establish and maintain good relationships? The same way you establish and maintain good re relationships with anyone. You be respectful of, of, what, they, of what they bring. Um, you, I think, well, I think there's, there's a, you listen for a start. Um, but there's several things that go into making a good relationship in a coaching engagement. Um, respect, a genuine valuing of the client. Listening to and a careful listening to the person. But also the process of um, really identifying or being engaged with the tensions that engage them if you like, so reflecting with them and thinking through with them. All of those things are important um, in building rapport and a sense of engagement yeah. with the client. So it comes down to understanding them and to, um, and to really working with them on their stuff. The other component um, is that while the person might like you personally, Unless the coaching is actually um, helping them open up new possibilities and open up the pathway to change, then that sort of, oh, I like you, doesn't help very much and mm. will only last so long. So I, I do like the idea that rapport is not something that we build before we do the work. Rapport is something that we build while we're doing the work. Right, right. And the doing of the work, the opening up of new possibilities, is itself a, a very significant um, contributor to the, the building of an effective working relationship. 
and uh, a sense of confidence in the coaching engagement and in the coaching relationship. And, and opening up new possibilities, is that the same as actual progress or is that just more options or what, what's that? Okay, so um, what do I mean by that? Um, intellectually, opening up new possibilities isn't the same as actual progress. But you can't make actual progress if there's not some new possibilities no, there. No, no. So um, I think the value add that coaches have is in the opening up of the new possibilities. Because we're not the ones that do the work, the client is the one that does the work. Yeah. And so they need to be able to see the new pathways and then um, work on them. Right. Now we can support them in the doing of that work, but we can't do that work for them. So the actual progress is down to the client. The possibilities for progress are down to the coaching relationship. Right, 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 right. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does, yeah. it does. So, um, so if you're not getting that translation from possibility into progress and you're not talking about that in the coaching engagement, then um, you probably need to be talking about it. And, and, and how could you talk about it? Like if someone comes back and does not experience progress, what, what, what could you talk about? Well, you need to understand how they're making sense of that. So it might be that progress is there, but they're just not seeing it. Or it might be that actually the intervention isn't working for them, that the situation was more complex or the dynamics were different, and therefore you need to talk about that. Right. And then you need to change what you're doing, do more of what works, do less of what doesn't work, and, um, and continue in that process. Right. right. So what do your clients tell you that is most helpful to them? In coaching, yeah, um, I think that there are two things that I think coaching is sort of about in some ways, and, and the clients reflect this as being helpful. One is support, supporting them, and, and getting an understanding of where they're at, so that sort of shared understanding thing. And the other is um, challenge. And I think that's what a coach really does, is they support and challenge. And what I mean by challenge is um, checking out assumptions, asking them to see a bigger picture, if you like. So where, for instance, they're seeing an either-or, a question might be, and what's the both end there? And it's that challenge that I think is ultimately the thing that, that clients reflect back to me as being the the thing that helps them most. Right, right, right. So that what they do is they walk away from the session or from the coaching engagement with a bigger view of the world, a capacity to make more complex meaning. Yeah. And that's the thing that really makes a difference for them. Right, right, right. And, when that, and so I'm talking now specifically about developmental coaching or coaching that's got a strong developmental component to it. Yeah. Um, Occasionally, depending on what the coaching engagement's about, it's the um, the structures that you put in place with the person to help keep them moving forward it gets reported back as being very helpful. But mostly, it's about uh, seeing the world differently. Right, right. I remember once, I think it was two thousand seven, when you were in Denmark. You said coaching was about sense making. Yes. And and you today you said uh, it's about opening up possibilities and the challenge. Are there other things that are important or just as important? Well, I see those, those things as, as almost synonymous. Okay, yeah. So that when I talk about opening, seeing the world in a way that opens up possibilities, we're talking about a different type of sense making. So, you know, most of the things that keep people stuck, that stop them moving towards their goals, is um, getting caught in a frame of reference, if you like, or seeing the world in a particular way that isn't helpful to them, or is helpful to them, but has some aspects that are not helpful to them. So, you know, what I often think is that every frame of reference, every story we tell ourselves, every way of seeing the world, every way of making sense, they, they enable some things to happen and disable some things. And really what a coach helps a person do is to step back from those frames of reference or that meaning making and that storytelling 
and, and to look at it and say, well, what does this story enable? What does this story disable or constrain? And what would be a better story or a bigger story or a different story that would enable some things that aren't enabled now? And that's what I mean by opening up pathways to action. Right, 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 right. And, and how do you find out whether your clients are progressing towards their, their goals? Uh, well, that's a bit like what we, we talked about before. Sometimes there'll be hard markers that you can assess. Um, sometimes you might use something like goal attainment scale. How do you think you're going on your goals? So if you, if, how would you know you're halfway there? Um, a, a fuzzier way of doing this is to use um, scaling, so something a solution-focused approach. Yeah. So if that perfect outcome was a 10 out of 10, where do you think you are now? Yeah. And what would be one, one thing that would make a difference? So if they think they're at a 4 out of 10, what would a 5 look like? It's a type of goal attainment scaling, if you like. Yeah. And so you can ask questions like that. Yeah. Um, others, other, other, I think often progress is best understood in hindsight. So um, one of the ways that you can, you can assess progress is to ask, as you're, as you're thinking about this issue, how do you see the way that you're thinking about it now? How would that be different to the way you might have thought about it six months ago or last year? What's different about that? And so you ask some questions that help them to notice the difference in the way they're making meaning. Right, 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 right. So it's not really a metric, but it's helping them to, to understand that there has been a shift. And why is that easier to, to see in hindsight? Um, because when you're in the middle of it, it's just the way you're making meaning. Yeah. So looking back to what, how life was, if you like, by how meaning making was, is sometimes easier than actually identifying um, how you're seeing the world now. Right. Because right. you're in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. You know. and, and what do you think causes some of the progress that you're seeing in your clients? What could be some of the... Um, some of the mechanisms for change. Yeah, yeah effective yeah. factors and mechanisms, how they, they relate. Okay, so I think... Um, Progress is an emergent property of the whole system. And so one of, the, one of the problems I have with the question is it wants to draw a linear chain of cause and effect. This leads to that, that equals progress. Yeah. And I think that um, a whole bunch of different things all are involved in progress and progress is also involved in them. So it's a non-linear sort of thing. So what are some of the things that I think are important? I think having a good quality working relationship is important. I think um, the person's sense of motivation for what they want, so you know, how engaged in the goal are they, is also important. I think um, the positivity of the relationship is important. And what I mean by positivity is, does the, the way that you talk about things and does the relationship create a positive emotional space? Yeah. I think hope is, is terribly important. Um, you know, the stuff about Vroom's expectancy theory, violence, expectancy and instrumentality, you know, faith in, uh, um, interest in the goal times faith in success, and that ties into hope. So I think there's lots of different things that are involved um, in creating good outcomes. The quality of the attention that is paid to the client is also very important. Do you actually take what they say seriously and engage with it? Um, now people will often, so you know, I think about this in terms of my own relationships in a way. You know, if I, if I just take an oppositional um, position to my wife, for instance, you know, we're having a fight and I just say no to this and she says no to that, then we tend to be stuck. Yeah. Um, so, so instead of taking an oppositional position, 
you know, constantly thinking, well, what is it? What is of value in what the person is saying? And, and how can you support that value and think about it in a bigger way? So that sense, the felt sense that the person has that, that their position is understood and valued, I think is critically important in, in, um, in progress. Not only because they get to see and, and experience what they're doing as, as positive, it also means that the elements of it that are less positive can be let go of. Yeah. Other things that are going on, like either factors, things that are important, or how... Oh, yeah, I mean, if you're taking a systemic view, then what's going on in the workplace is critically important. What's happening around the client is critically important. Um, you know, so, so what's happening in the organisation, what's happening in, at home, I mean, all of these factors play into the progress that the client will make. And, and how do they play in? They play in, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and that will be very unique to the particular case and the particular person. So for instance, if, um, if you're working on um, some sort of goal and the, the processes and structures in the organisation don't support that sort of goal. So for instance, you might be working with a, a leader on, on developing um, good communication and teamwork, for instance. But um, all the team members are assessed and re uh, remunerated on individual achievement. Then that structure is going to work against the goal yeah, that you're working yeah. on. You know, so, so you've got to take into account systemic influences, personality, what's happening in the person's family life. I mean, all of that is a part of the system. Right, right. And, and, and what, what can you do to kind of enhance the, the possibility or so, so, so make sure that, or not make sure, but at least help uh, enable the, the clients to, to create the outcomes that they want? Can, can you do something about these important things? It, well, the first thing is notice their impact right, to, right. The gr to the degree that you can. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the ways of doing that is by really paying close attention to the client and asking questions about you know what might work for you and what mightn't work for you and what are you worried about in, in, you know, as you think about implementing this action plan what thoughts come up and they can often be pointers towards other systemic elements that you haven't noticed right 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 and so you know uh, noticing that paying attention to what I call the niggles yeah which is that little thought in the back of your head that goes mm -hmm, and maybe this isn't right Paying attention to that thought, I think, is critically important because um, they're easy to step around. Oh, we've got a good action plan, and there's a little thought in the back going, "Yeah, but, but, but," and it's easy to sort of step around that thought in the back of your head. Yeah. Because the action plan will get in the way of the action plan. Actually, stopping and, and bringing that out and saying, you know, what's at stake here? What's intention? What's the the conflict or the or the concern? can often help create an even better action plan. Right, right. And, and what, what happens, like, do you do something to help the, the clients implement the action plan? Like, what happens in between the session? You, you've opened up possibilities, you've challenged them, they see things in a new way, mm -hmm. and then they go home mm -hmm. and try to implement it? Yep. C can you do something to, to influence that situation? Uh, while they're impl implementing it? Yeah. Um, Certain things you can do, you can, you can, um, in a sense, uh, you know, send them an email reminding them or that sort of thing. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or you have the homework assignment, you have the follow up, you have. Yeah, there's the, those sorts of things you can do, um, but typically, if if it requires you to do that, then there's something wrong with the coaching. Right, right. So um, the engagement of the person in their goals needs to be paramount so you know if they require me to chase them along then that's a conversation we need to have right 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 because right. Um, ultimately they need to do the work yeah um, and typically it's in some ways in many ways it's better that they are doing the work because then they own it yeah and they learn to adapt as they go along 
Now what we can do to is then enter into that reflective process. How did it go? What worked? What didn't? And so on. What was your experience? And and my role is to help them reflect on that. Yeah. Um, so that the next time they try something, it's even better targeted. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and what do you do uh, to develop yourself as a professional? Well, lots of stuff. I do a lot of reading. Um, I have regular supervision with, um, with a supervisor and that's focused on um, mostly how I'm making meaning of what's going on, uh, both in coaching and in my personal life because I don't think you can really separate those two out too much. Um, at a sort of technical level in terms of different techniques and so on, I'll talk to my peers, so have some sort of peer supervision or collaboration. Um, I, I find that one of the, so supervision for me I think is the most important developmental yeah. intervention for me personally. But doing things like teaching and developing workshops and um, experimenting in the coaching engagement, I think they're all important developmental components as well. Yeah. I, you know, when you have to teach something, you learn it in a way you don't when you're just sitting in a workshop. Yeah. 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 And, and when you learn something new, how do you integrate it into the way that you work? Um, that varies. Right. I mean, usually it's, you start, like most things, you start off and it's a bit clunky. And as you go, you learn about, you know, how, how to implement something. Um, so, for instance, what well, an example? Um, I recently um, did some work on on, on uh, learning a model called the Kinevin model, yeah. um, which is a complexity model, and um, implementing that means typically the way that I do that in a coaching session is telling people about it. Yeah, um, we're discussing the model with them and asking them how how would this fit with them. Now, the way that you talk about it gets better as you go, because yeah. you, you learn as you go. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And, and if you had no knowledge of positive psychology, like the VIA, Broaden and Build, uh, Hope and stuff like that, would the way that you do coaching, would that be different? Oh, yes. How? Well, I think that um, if you're working from theory to practice, so principles into practice, um, a lot of the principles that are associated with um, clinical psychology, which is my area of training, tend to be based on an assumption that what we're doing is remediation. Yeah. And um, that's not always the best assumption to be making. So I think that, um, you know, when I think back to my early days of coaching, I was often looking for problems. What's the problem? What's the problem? give me something that fits my mental models as opposed to how do we adapt our mental models to fit what's going on for the person. Um, and I think what, what positive psychology does is give a whole lot of different ways of adapting the mental models to fit the person. Now, um, having said that, I think that really good clinicians do that too. Yeah. So, I, you know, I actually quite disagree with the notion that positive psychology, clinical psychology equals negative psychology and positive psychology equals good psychology, mm -hmm. if you like, um, because I think both are important. And I've spoken about that with you know, people like Chris Peterson and so on, that um, both aspects of the person, both, both the person's weaknesses and strengths, are often important in helping the person achieve the goals that they want to achieve. Yeah. And are there things we've not talked about that are important to understand the way that you work with coaching and, and take some from positive psychology into it? Yeah, I think um, one of the, the critical things, and we've sort of touched on it, is developmental psychology. So looking at how do people develop in the, their capacity to make complex meaning of situations. So one of the important theories that, um, that I would look at would be something like Keegan's constructive developmental theory. So how do people construct their world? Um, and I think they're really useful um, 
uh, theories to bring to coaching. Um, if we neglect that aspect of the person, their meaning making, then and, and neglect noticing the patterns of meaning making that are going on, we can often get ourselves into trouble because um, what happens is you expect a person to understand something in one way and yet they're understanding it in a very different way. Yeah. And because you haven't noticed that, it's almost like you end up passing like ships in the night. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and, and how, how do you use that theory? Like, how does it influence the way that you work? Um, okay, so how does it influence the way that I work? It, um, it makes me much more alive to the assumptions that, that are going on in the sort of things that I say and the sort of things that the other person says. And so questioning assumptions, um, it makes me listen harder to the structure of how people make meaning rather than the things, the content of what they say. So I'll ask many more questions like, well, what's important about that for you? As opposed to just assuming that whatever they've said is, is what's really at stake here. Yeah. Um, it, it, it helps me to, to understand that the way that they're making sense of things is part of their world view and that that needs to be valued. Yeah. But like every world view, it's a frame of reference and it will enable some actions to be sensible and to, will encourage some actions to take place and other actions to not take place. And so, um, so it's also about recognizing that when you're playing with someone's worldview, you're playing with the, the ground they walk on, yeah. if you like. Yeah. And, um, and so it needs to be done very sensitively. And that's why the support is so important, as well as the challenge. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Other things we've not talked about that are important to understand the way that you work? Um, not that I can think of. There probably are, but it's not coming up. <laughs> Yeah. Right, right. And, and what advice would you give to other people who want to start applying some of the research, particularly from positive psychology into coaching? Um, I think that if you're going to apply theories, right, you need to get inside them. You need to understand what are the dynamics, the sort of psychomechanics, if you like of these theories. What are they saying is really taking place? And to always hold them lightly. Um, one of the dangers happens when you hear a piece of research. So for instance, you know, we've just done a big piece of research on looking at leadership in high stress workplaces and found that developmental coaching increases well-being. Right? Now, that just because that happens, it doesn't necessarily mean that developmental coaching is the best intervention for our person. Yeah. Um, so, just you know, having a very superficial grasp of the findings of research and using those. Um, okay, okay, I'll give you a good example. Lasada and Hefe did a bunch of work built on Fredrickson's um, Gordon and Bill theory, looking at complexity, uh, looking at um, the way positive three dimensions, positivity. Um, advocacy and inquiry work in team dynamics. Yeah. Now what they found, like John Gottman's work, was that a ratio of between 2.9 to 1 or 3 to 1 and 5 to 1 positivity to negativity is very predictive of, um, of performance in teams. Now a superficial reading of that would say that what we need for every three negative statements we need five positive um, for every five, sorry, go back. For every one negative statement, we need five positive statements, and so we just look at the way that a team talks, and we make them use more positive language. Well, I don't think that that's going to do a huge amount. I think that understanding the dynamics of what's going on there is really important. So, I think that those markers of, of positivity versus negativity, and inquiry versus advocacy, and Self and other. Self versus other um, are really surface markers of a deeper process of dialogue. And so understanding what that deeper process is that the surface markers are metrics for 
um, I think is critically important. So my advice to people trying to use research and theory is get inside it. Uh, there's no real substitute for really good quality learning and, and trying to reflect on what this really means. Uh, let yourself be challenged in conversations with your peers around this stuff. Do your research, do your learning and, um, and, and think about stuff. Become a reflective practitioner. Yeah. Um, I think that's the best way to, to apply research. And, and you said hold the theory slightly, what, what, what do you mean? Well, theories are frames of reference you know, and um, they will enable some things to happen and other things to not happen. Yeah. So, you know, a cognitive behavioural approach says, for instance, that our early childhood experiences lead to the formation of schemas which lead to activation of automatic negative thoughts within um, certain situations and that leads to a whole bunch of other stuff. That's one way of understanding how things go, but it doesn't capture all of the world. Mm. Another theory, for instance Adrian Wells' self-regulation, no, self-regulatory executive function theory, says that actually metacognitive processes rather than cognitive processes, rather than the content of beliefs, are more um, are a bigger part of causing outcomes, if you like. Yeah. So the sort of um, uh, action plans that people implement to deal with self-relevant threat, for instance, may be more important than the beliefs that they have about that self-relevant threat. Yeah, yeah. Now, cognitive behavioural theory will say the beliefs are important and that's what you need to change. Wells's theory says the metacogn metacognitive, the action plans, if you like, the, the strategies that the person holds, are the critical things. Yeah. And if you address those, then the beliefs themselves will change. Yeah, yeah. So you need to to hold these theories lightly and and look for where are they useful and where they're not, and let them go when they're not useful. Yeah, yeah. But holding them lightly doesn't mean not understanding them. You really need to to get inside them and understand them. Then, um, then you can you can hold them effectively. Right, right, right. Mm. You also mentioned well-being, and, and most of what we talked about is about performance, development, that sort of stuff. Can mm. can you say something more about well-being? Um, well, ultimately, I believe that um, all helping interventions are about enhancing well-being, short term and long term, um, both in the client, you know, in the organisation, and in the client and that um, where well-being is pitted against productivity, for instance, so that they're seen in opposition, then ultimately you'll have a, an unsustainable system. And so um, the job of the coach, in a sense, is always to enhance well-being and productivity sometimes. Um, so, and it depends on the goals, so it's performance and well-being. To have performance outside of well-being is, is actually just damaging people. It's using people as resources. Yeah, yeah. And so I think well-being is a critical part of coaching. And, and how, how do you get it into your coaching if, if the goal is, let's say, sales or, you know, whatever? Well, that's, once again, it comes back to tying the performance goal into what's really important for the person and the processes through which they achieve those performance goals have to be congruent with the person. Right, right, right. So when those things happen, then you end up, you typically end up with well-being. Right, right, right. Okay. And uh, when they don't happen, you typically end up with a lesser sense of well-being. Yeah, yeah. You know, a sort of reduction in well-being. Right, right, right. Is that something, can you say that again? Yeah, so I guess one of the things that maybe didn't come across as clearly as it might is that my understanding of the coaching engagement is not a sort of a linear process where you start with a goal and sort of go through a sort of a managed pro process that gets to the end state. That it's much more about an emergent system. So that there's a whole lot of non-linear stuff that takes place. So I guess the, the analogy 
um, and a lot of the questions that were asked in this interview sort of seem to assume that sort of linear process. And so that's why I found it a little difficult to answer. I think, I think coaching is much more about an evolving system than it is about managing a process uh, of project management. Yeah. Um, and I think that that evolution and that complex adaptive um, and emergent system is what gives coaching its really it, it, its real value in the world. So that what we're doing is we're working out solutions that neither of us came into the session with. Yeah. Um, and we're actually even working out what is the question that we're dealing with um, in a way that neither of us brought into the session in yeah. the first place. And that's why I think um, it is a useful intervention in today's world. Today's world, I think, really does require those emergent solutions um, because that's where the innovation is. Um, if it's just about we know what the question is and let's work out a solution to it, um, then it's almost like a technical process and I think coaching is much more than that. I think coaching is about working out the question we're dealing with. Yeah. In a sense, Einstein said it really well. He said that um, a problem can't be solved with the same level of thinking that creates it. Yeah. And he also said that if I had um, an hour to solve a problem and my wife depended on it, I'd spend the first 50 minutes thinking what is the question. And I think coaching sort of takes those two things and joins them together. That in order to solve the problem that we face, the complex problems that people face in, in life and in organisations and in the world, they need to get a perspective on them that's different to the one that constitutes the, the issue as a problem. Yeah. And coaching is about spending that 50 minutes of the hour finding that um, new perspective yeah. and then the project management kicks in, yeah, if you yeah, like. Yeah. Um, whereas a lot of approaches to coaching sort of seems to start with, well we've got the question sorted, now what are we going to do? Yeah, yeah. And I think where coaching really adds its value is in understanding the question. Yeah. And that's the evolving part of it. The solution also evolves as the question evolves, Yeah. but it's not so much a straightforward project management approach right. and I think that's the real value of coaching. And are there some of the concepts that I have introduced in some of the questions that you would kind of leave behind, not use, and then other concepts like evolving, emergence, complex adaptives, mm -hmm. like what, what concepts would kind of capture what's going on? It's not that I'd leave any of those concepts behind, I might just understand them differently. So for instance, measuring progress, you know, it sounds like you can put a ruler up against what's going on and, and then be certain about where you are and where you're going. I think it's still important to measure progress, but I don't hold that same level of certainty around it. Right, right, right. Because progress relates to where you expect to be, and I understand that where you expect to be may change. Right. Um, and that systems evolve in unexpected and unpredictable ways. That's true of the coaching engagement, and it's true of the system in which the person is working. The assumption underneath it, um, underneath a sort of a more linear approach to coaching, is somehow we can get a view of the system and implement behaviours that have predictable responses. And actually, even if we can get a bit of a view of the system, we can't always predict what our interventions will produce. Mm. And unexpected stuff emerges, and so you need to be alive to that and to be in that moment. Um, and, and working with what arises. And so the notion of sort of measuring progress changes when you think about it that way. Yeah.